And then the Jews said, see how much he loved him. But some of them said, he healed the eyes of the man, of the man born blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? And the reason why I shared this story with you, because in preparation for the seminar, I felt that the one thing that stands out to me in the story probably, or perhaps for the first time in light of our seminar today, is this, that the turning point for this family came when they encountered Jesus. That's when the turning point happened. Before there was no hope, he is in the tomb, nothing can help our situation, and, um, but when Jesus shows up and they turn to him, everything, there's light all of a sudden there, there's hope again. And so that's what I mean, that our pain has to really collide with God's grace, and we have to open ourselves up to, um, to God comforting us and using everything around us. So it's the biggest challenge, and often the loss can feel overwhelming. Have you felt overwhelmed in your loss? You know, where it just the burden is too heavy, and nobody can really lift that burden. And um, you may experience all kinds of difficult and unexpected emotions, from shock or anger to disbelief, guilt, and profound sadness. How would you describe profound sadness? Immobile. Well, really, nothing that a person can say will help it. That's it. You know, I, I've said this recently to people often that really, humanly speaking, there isn't anything that anybody can say to make this better other than the words of God. They can. That's why this scripture even, tell everyone who is discouraged, uh, be strong and don't be afraid. Not because a church is saying it or uh, somebody is saying it to you, a human being, but God, in being human and also the Son of God, um, that God is coming to your rescue. And what that rescue is going to look like, we don't know. We don't know that, but he, God is working on your behalf. So um, the pain of grief can also disrupt your physical health, making it difficult to sleep, eat, or even think straight. How many of you have lost more things since you have had loss in your life? It's really, I mean, you just, it's misplaced and you can track it down. So that's quite a few of you. That's true. So it's almost like we're walking through a fog through, through this, this, this heavy cloud over us. And, and those things, when we lose them, we must, might have lost them two days ago, but just now we're realizing it. So that's, that's what this is talking about. Um, so it affects your health, uh, health I should say. I, I, it's difficult to sleep. Um, you don't eat as you should, um, and you don't think straight. And these are all normal reactions to a significant loss, but while there is no right or wrong way to grieve, there are healthy ways to cope with the pain uh, that in time can ease your sadness and help you come to terms with your loss and find new meaning and purpose. And probably the key sentence in this slide would be that there is no right or wrong way to grieve, right? And that's why one of the things that we will say in our grief support group is that when you come to our meetings, we are not telling you that this is the only way how you should be dealing with this. Uh, we can exchange our experiences, um, but your grief and your loss is unique, and uh, therefore, um, the way how you are being led through uh, the grief is um, unique to your circumstance and to your situation. And again, referring to a conversation that I had with Elida earlier, is when we, uh, so many of us have a cold right now, and I can tell you that if you go to your doctor and he's going to look at your symptoms and he's going to say, well, these are the symptoms that I've seen in a hundred other people lately, so guess what? You're going to get the same antibiotics, right? Like everybody else does, but that's not how it works with grief. The symptoms are um, the same, but the people are not the same. So we are going through the same experience in a way, but God knows your individual life. He knows what your life experience has been all throughout, and he takes all of that into account, and he knows how to help you best and reach you the best in your time of, of need. So this is what we, what we look like when we, uh, what we look, what we look at when we look at grief. We think a grief is going to work real nice like that. You have a beginning point, and then you have an ending point. But really, this is how grief looks like. 
right? It's all tangled up. It's not very neat. It's really messy. And, um, and again, I want to refer that your faith is going to be key in overcoming this. And then um, I am going to read a few things that um, people are saying that they were someone had told them when they experienced loss. And there are actually over 60 of them, but I'm not going to read all of them, don't worry. <laughs> just a few that I felt were s something we hopefully can relate to. And if there's something, just feel free to interrupt or interject. No matter how prepared you think you are for death, you can never be fully prepared for the loss and the grief. 100% of the population is affected by loss. We know that. Uh, oftentimes from a very early childhood on, we experience loss in the family, and we know that this is part of life, but no matter how much we are prepared, we can never be completely prepared for it. Number nine, death and grief make people uncomfortable, so be prepared for awkward encounters. You walk away and you go like, ooh, I don't know what to do with that right now. You know, either what the person said or how they related to you, how they tried to comfort you, we've already touched on that. You will plan for the funeral while in a haze. If you aren't happy with the funeral you had, have another memorial service later. And I thought that was really a good idea. You know, you might, because of the circumstances and the pressure that you were under, it was nothing what you felt was honoring to your, your loved one. And who is there to say that you couldn't have a memorial service later, right? And that's what we do so often with celebration of life services, that they happen at a completely different time and maybe in a different place as well. Number 13, people will stay, say stupid, hurtful things without even realizing it. So we already referred to that. And it's not that they meant, meant to say those things in the way how we experience them, but I always like to refer to the fact that when you are going through your loss, Everything that a person is going to say is going to be a hundred times magnified. So you are going to be so super sensitive that no matter what people are going to say, uh, you have to be really careful because we are at a, at a situation where we misinterpret or read even things in there that don't necessarily weren't or weren't necessarily meant by that person to be that way. Number 13, uh, uh, 14, I'm sorry. People will tell you things that aren't true about your grief. Did you experience that? What would that be that aren't true? Oh, I could think of a lot of things. Well, God needed your loved one. That's why he took them to heaven. Mm -hmm. Those are very typical statements that people will say, and they're not true. They're not true about your grief, and if they're not, um, then, you know, um, th it's okay for us to also, in a, an appropriate setting, to address that or to make, uh, give yourself voice in how you feel about that. Death brings out the best and the worst in families, so be prepared. Oftentimes, family conflict arises, and not rare. I've talked to many funeral directors <laughs> because um, the way how it was in Ohio is I didn't drive my own car to the cemetery, but I drove with the funeral director. And you know, those are actually very good times to exchange and get a better feel for what's going on in the family. And they will sometimes share things. And oftentimes the conflict is about what? Money, Money that's right. Or, or a relational conflict between family members. Number 18, there will always be regrets. No matter how much time you had, you'll always want more. So there's never a right time. You always want the person to be around longer, to hold on to them, of course. And then grief doesn't come in five neat stages. Grief is messy and confusing. Number 35, grief triggers are everywhere. You will see things that remind you of your loved one all over the place. And it may lead to sudden outbursts of emotion. Right? And you were, you were doing fine when you got up in the morning. You went through three quarters of the day and you were doing great. And then maybe something happens that you come across that will just trigger that emotion in you and there you are, you're facing it again. Um, then people will tell you what you should and shouldn't feel and how you should and shouldn't grieve. And I like the last two words, ignore them. 
Yeah, you have the liberty to ignore things that you know do not work for you. You can just say, nope, I don't need to take that or I don't need to own that. Um, number 40, there is no normal when it comes to grieving. I have a friend who says normal is something that's uh, a dial on your washer and dryer. <laughs> normal in our lives, what's normal, right? I mean, we, we, ex we experience uh, a very difficult thing when it comes to grief and what would be normal. 46, people love to judge how you are doing. Watch out for those people. You know, oh, they, they're done grieving, for example. That's not even really possible, right? We're never done grieving. Um, it does get better, though. I do want to say that as, a, as for those of you, because there are some of you here that are very new, uh, your loss has just been very recent, that the good news is it does get better. It does get, you feel, uh, you feel more peace, and it, it will get better, uh, but it will not go away uh, where you say, I'm done grieving. Number 47, you can't compare grief or compare losses, though people will try. Now, that's really important, too, that, you know, um, sometimes you're in conversation with someone and they will say, well, but I had five losses and you only had two. I mean, they're not going to say it like that. But you know what I'm trying to say. Right away, the comparison. What is your grief in comparison to mine? Next one, just because you feel pretty good one day, it doesn't mean you're cured of your grief. So you can get up in the morning and you can go about the day and you can say, yeah, I feel pretty good today and I'm, it's easier today a little bit. I have more peace. I, I'm calmer on the inside. I'm not as, as stressed out or I don't feel the pain as much. That doesn't mean that you're cured, obviously, uh, even though you feel pretty good. Next one, there are many days when you feel totally and completely alone, whether you are or not. And I was just talking to someone during our break about that. You know, some of us have a more independent streak, independent personality, and we think, oh, I've never been lonely in my whole life, even though you've been alone. But this time in your life can bring that out very, very strongly, where you feel like you are truly alone. And, and I guess, again, uh, our hope is that um, the assurance that God has said that he will never leave us or forsake us Number 52, grief can make you a stronger person than you were before. You say yes, why? In, in my situation, okay, I'm going to be really honest, when my first husband passed away, uh, I had wonderful friends that surrounded me. But we had, I think this is also part of when, when you have retired, you're with each other more, okay? Constant, constant. And so when that other person is gone, suddenly out of your life, um, there's some physical things that happened with me. I had what they call the heart problem, uh, which it does happen in some grief. Where, and you hear where somebody will pass at the same time. Um, I felt like someone had just torn something out of my chest. Mm. And uh, friends of mine stayed with me uh, for a couple of days until I finally was able to sit down and ask the Lord where to go in the Bible to help me with that. And then I knew that everything was going to be okay. So that was the st start. But it was a time when I did not want to live. Had 40, 40 years together and best friends, and I saw no purpose in living. Uh, so that that situation, and uh, what was I going to try to tell you? About how it has made you stronger. What made me stronger then was realizing that I had great people around me to help me through it, and that what we had couldn't be dismissed you had to take all that and make it work forward. Hmm. And when I lost my second husband, uh, as Pastor Attila knows, and of course several people here, I had within a month or two of losing him, and I was still said, why is this happening to me now again, you know? Uh, I had a calling, and the calling was 
that I should help other people with their grief. Mm. And so I partnered and learned how to be a grief counselor. And I, I kept telling people who would say to me, I don't know how I would have made it without you. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. It's direct. It's just direct. It comes from God. It comes from Jesus and our love of Jesus and to listen and hear what we're supposed to do with it. So the grief turned around and I got so much healing from doing what God wanted me to do at that moment. Okay, great. So that basically, uh, the comfort that you receive, you can then pass it on to others. Yeah. And that's also in Corinthians, it's talking about that. All right, um, the next one is, it's okay to cry sometimes. Next one, it's okay not to cry sometimes. You know, sometimes even at a funeral. You know, we, we judge people and say, well, they didn't cry, so they must have not loved the person. <laughs> well, I've heard that, have you? Uh, that happens, you know, people judge because you don't, cr you don't grieve like others grieve, so we judge. And that's not true because that person might express their grief in completely different ways. All right. Now this one is good, listen to this one. Grief rewrites your address book. Sometimes the people you think will be there for you are not. And people you never expect become your biggest supporters. So people will step up that you didn't even know you had a connection with. And then the last one, I highlighted it, it's okay to tell people when they are not being helpful. I just said that, you know, earlier that it's okay for you to express if you feel, you know, that statement really is, uh, you can say, I'm offended by that, or that really hurts me. And we're going to have a resource for you that should be helping that. And I know if you are a non-confrontive person, you're not going to want to do that. But what if the person keeps redoing that all the time and you can't escape it? Then you have to say something in order to protect um, um, and to work through what you are going through at that given moment. All right. Here's a quote about how we feel about the person that we have lost. Your name is upon my tongue. Your image is in my sight. And your memory is in my heart. And somebody said a moment ago that I didn't bring a picture. I think it was Andrea and said, but the picture's right here. And I think that expresses that, expresses that wonderfully. And I'm going to just say it right here, even though it doesn't connect to this because I know I, otherwise I'm going to forget. One thing that I have learned over the years of ministering to people that are dying is be careful what you say around their hospital bed or bed at home because they can hear everything you are saying. Did you know that? Everything. That's the last thing to go is their hearing. And I have heard so many times people talking about all kinds of stuff that probably the person should not be hearing. So that's, that's, we have to be very sensitive about that. And I'm just putting this in here, even though it doesn't connect to it, because otherwise I will forget. Go ahead. Oh, that's right. They, they do hear and we don't think because maybe their eyes are closed or closed more than open and we think they're not aware, but they are. They can hear everything. And so that's very important. But again, your name is upon my tongue, your image is in my sight, and your memory is in my heart. Whatever your loss is, it's personal to you, and you don't feel ashamed about how you feel. That's very important, you know, because we live in a culture where people can st constantly expect of you to be strong. Strong is number one. Did you know that? And what do you do when you are not strong? How do you survive it? How do you work through it? So even subtle losses in life can trigger a sense of grief. For example, you might grieve over moving away from home, um, uh, from a home, graduating from college, or changing jobs. I've heard that many times before. People are just working like crazy to get a degree, a doctorate, or something. And then they get the di diploma, and it's a huge letdown. Because you worked for it for so long, and now you have it, and it, it kind of is a disappointment. It isn't what you were expecting. 
It gi doesn't give you that fulfillment. So uh, that can be a loss or that can be a, a point of grieving. Changing jobs can be that. Whatever your loss, it's personal to you, so don't feel ashamed about how you feel or believe that it's somehow only appropriate to grieve for certain things. If the person, animal, relationship, or situation was significant to you, it's normal to grieve um, the loss you are experiencing. Whatever the cause of your grief, though, there are healthy ways to deal with the pain and eventually come to terms with your loss. So again, you know, we talked about the loss of a pet, we talked about um, you know, I mean, I've heard that many times before. Somebody sold their house, and now they're moving into a condo, and that's an adjustment because they lived there, you know, three quarters of their life in that one spot, you know, and now they're moving, and, and so that can be a grief, a certain grief. Walking through grief. Grieving is a highly individual experience. There's no right or wrong way to grieve. How you grieve depends on many factors, including your personality. Everybody say personality. And coping style, your life experience, your faith, and how significant the loss was to you. Inevitably, the grieving process takes time. It does take time. You know, this isn't something you hurry up. Even coming to an event like this, a grief seminar, it's, I mean, I could walk up to, let's say, Barbara and say, oh, you need to come to this grief seminar. How do I know that if Barbara is ready for it or not? I can say, you know, if you feel like that maybe you're strong enough right now to face that, why don't you come? I think it can really help you. That's an invitation, but I don't know if the person is ready. You have to be ready. And I commend some of you who have had very recent losses. It's, it's not easy. It's difficult to be here today. But I think God's going to reward you and help you uh, with this experience. It can't be forced or hurried, and there is no normal timetable for grieving. Some people start to feel better in weeks or months. I've seen that. I've seen people come to a grief um, um, to like uh, grief support group, they were there maybe a handful of times and they were doing really better. You could tell. You could tell that they were making progress and that they were at a point where they could deal uh, or work through their grief and they were now okay. They didn't have to come anymore. And then I see others that have attended it for years. So there is no timetable for that. For others, the grieving process is measured in years, whatever your grief experience, it is important to be patient with yourself and allow the process to naturally unfold. And you know, we're gonna talk about the, the different stages in a little bit and what those stages look like, um, but um, God is working this out in you, um, but you have to be patient with yourself too. And you know, if somebody says, and um, you know, I've heard that from other people often too, that it's like, oh, I feel so bad that I need to cry. It's okay, we can cry. You should cry because a, a good explanation of what happens when we're grieving and crying is you're washing out your soul. It needs to come out. You can get physically sick if you don't. So it's okay for us to cry. Myth and fact. Now, this is going to be fun. Myth number one, the pain will go away faster if you ignore it. Oh, that's like a destination for disaster. Um, but yet, in our culture, we're very good at that. You know, to ignore it. Oh, if I ignore it, then, then it's going to get better. Trying to ignore your pain or keep it from surfacing will only make it worse in the long run. For real healing, it is necessary to face your grief and actively deal with it. And you being here today is actively dealing with it. Reading a book, a resource on grief is actively dealing with it. Watching something that addresses this issue is you actively taking part in it. Like even that part here, when you came forward, you put out the picture, you shared about your loved one, and you lit a candle was part of your healing. It's like you shared something that you typically don't talk about. You don't discuss this every day with someone, but this time is sacred for that. We put it aside so that you could do that. Um, next myth is it's important to be strong in the face of loss. Feeling sad, frightened, or lonely is a normal reaction to loss. Crying doesn't mean you are weak. You don't need to protect your family or friends by putting on a brave front. Showing you your true feelings can help them and you. That's another thing we're very good at, putting on a strong front. You know? And who is judging you when you are weak and when you are not doing that well? You know, and I could tell when I said, well, if you don't feel... Um, 
you know, if somebody is not being helpful to you and you telling them you're not being helpful, I saw some of you cringing. But how am I going to do that? But you have to. If you want to um, not feel that pain or that hurt that they might be causing through those um, uh, things that they're saying. If you don't cry, it means you aren't sorry about the loss. We just talked about that crying is a normal response to sadness, but it's not the only one. Those who don't cry may feel the pain just as deeply as others. They may simply have other ways of showing it. Just going for long walks might be a way of showing it. Being alone might be a way of doing that. I need alone time. I can't be around people right now. And that doesn't mean you're isolating yourself. You're just taking the time to work through what you are thinking about, what you're struggling with. Next one, grieving should last about 12 months, one year. Well, you know what? There is some truth to that. We also say that um, it has a nugget of truth in it, that one year, there are going to be markers like that. But we also recommend that you don't make any major decisions within the first year of your loss. And I have experienced that firsthand in a family's life that made a major life-changing decision within a couple months after the two losses occurred in the family and it turned out to be a disaster. So you're not in the right frame of mind to make big decisions such as moving, selling your house and things like that. Um, there is no specific time frame for grieving. How long it takes differs from person to person. Moving on with your life means forgetting about your loss. Moving on means you've accepted your loss, but that's not the same as forgetting. You can move on with your life and keep the memory of someone or something you lost as an important part of you. In fact, as we move through life, these memories can become more and more integral to defining the people we are. And that book that we gave away, um, that's Sharon? Shirley. Shirley. Um, that is talking about that. It's talking about basically as a widow, uh, living for God after losing your husband. You know, defining your purpose. Uh, what, what God has for you from here on forward. What does he want you to do? Um, okay, next one. Stages of grief. In 1969, psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross introduced what became known as the five stages of grief. These stages of grief were based on her studies of the feelings of patients facing terminal illness, but many people have generalized them uh, to other types of negative life changes and losses such as the death of a loved one or a breakup. So if you're losing a relationship, it's like that. It's a loss. It's a grieving that you go through. And um, I thought, you know, we all know the stages. Like, you know, we've heard it. You've heard it probably many times. There's denial. There's anger. There's bargaining. There's depression. There's acceptance. But I like for us to look at it and put it into a sentence. You know, what does it mean, uh, denial? Well, denial and grief could be, this can't be happening to me. It's happening, it's happened to other people, but no, it can't be happening to me. That would be denial. Anger would be, why is this happening? And then, of course, the big question, who should we blame for it? Uh, the first thing, somebody needs to be blamed for it, so who is it? Um, bargaining, make this not happen, and if it goes away, then in return, I will be the best Christian ever. That's bargaining. You're bargaining with God. It's like, you do this for me, I do that for you. Depression. I am too, do, too sad to do anything. Your life comes to a halt, to a standstill. It's like an incapable, you're incapable of doing anything. That would be a sign of depression. And then acceptance. I am at peace with what happened. You know, people are telling you that, that, you know, I struggled so bad. The last two years were terrible, but now I feel I'm coming to terms or with it or I have peace over it. It's different now than what it used to be. I think that's helpful to, instead of just saying denial, right? So now you know what that would look like when we're going through it. The stages of grief. If you're experiencing any of these emotions following loss, it may help to know that, you are rea that your reaction is natural and that you'll heal in time. However, not everyone who grieves goes through all these stages, and that's okay. Contrary to popular belief, you do not have to go through each stage in order to heal. In fact, some people resolve their grief without going through any of these stages. 
And if you do go through these stages of grief, you probably won't experience them in a neat sequential order like they were just mentioned there, you know? But you might go through one, and then you go through the last one, and then you go back to one again. So it's, it's not, not really neatly structured like that. Um, uh, Kubler-Ross herself never intended for these stages to be a rigid framework that apply to everyone who mourns. In her last book, before her death in 2004, she said of the five stages of grief, they were never meant to help tuck messy emotions into neat packages. You know, and um, you know, some of us, if you're a type A personality, and you like to have everything just right and just in order and get things done and accomplish them quickly, you might want to approach grief like that. Or I might want to address it like that, but that's not how it works. Uh, it can be extreme, it can be you know, out of order or not, um, not neat at all. Um, but there is no, not a typical response to loss as there is no typical loss. Our grieving is as individual as our lives. Grief can be a roller coaster. And we said it earlier that you know, one day you might be feeling great and then the next day you feel like your whole life is falling apart. Nothing works right. Isn't there a song, when love goes wrong, nothing, nothing goes right? Right? So instead of a series of stages, we might also think of the grieving process as a roller coaster full of ups and downs, highs and lows. Like many roller coasters, the right tends to be rougher in the beginning. The lows may be deeper and longer. The difficult period should become less intense and shorter at, as time goes by. So that goes to what I said a little while ago, that it will get better. You know, and I know when you are at the very beginning of your loss, you might not feel that at all. You might feel like, oh, this is never going to get better. Or I'm not making any sort of progress. Um, even years after a loss, especially at special events such as a family wedding or the birth of a child, we may still experience a strong sense of grief. And this is from the Hospice Foundation of America. And I do want to say a word about hospice. Hospice does do an amazing work. They do have a follow-up. Uh, with hospice where you um, go and like after your loss occurred, they're with you before, uh, during, and after, and that's important. Then it has physical symptoms when we grieve. You know, it takes a toll on us physically. We often think of grief as strictly emotional, but grief often involves physical problems including fatigue, nausea, lowered immunity, weight loss or weight gain, aches and pains, and insomnia. I think the last one is probably a big one. You know, that you're just not able to sleep. You wake up and uh, you, you are facing that reality, and, um, but it affects us physically. So therefore, being in touch with your doctor during grief is a very good idea um, to uh, take care of yourself physically as much as you can. Even if you know that, you're not, that you can't sleep, try to rest as much as you can. Um, you know, just watch out for what you eat and, and all those kind of things. Seek help in your time of grief and loss. So um, the pain of grief can often cause you to uh, want to withdraw from others and retreat into your shell, but having face-to-face -face support of other people is vital um, to healing from loss. And there's going to be times in your grief where you need that alone time. We just talked about that. You know, you just, you don't need to be around people and that's okay. But if it gets to a point where we isolate ourselves completely from others, that's what this is talking about. That's not healthy and that's not good. So sometimes you're going to have to force yourself to do things, right? To, even to go to church might be a discipline at times. You just say, well, you know what? I don't feel like doing this, but I know it's good for me, so I'm going to do it. And it's okay for you, too, to maybe, you used to always sit where Barbara sits right now. That's her spot. Here, this is where she likes to sit. But on those Sundays where you feel like you have to talk yourself to going into church, it's okay to sit in the back uh, pew, and it's okay for you to just slip out when you need to do that. So setting those boundaries right. Uh, comfort can also come from just being around others who care about you. The key is not to isolate yourselves. That is important. Um, seek help in your time of grief and loss. That's our theme. Uh, turn to friends and family members. You know, 
And um, it says that and now is the time to lean on people who care about you, even if you take pride in being strong and self-sufficient. Rather than avoiding them, draw friends and loved ones close, spend time together face to face, and accept the assistance that's offered. Often people want to help but don't know how, so tell them what you need, whether it's a shoulder to cry on, help with funeral arrangements, or just something to hang out with. If you don't feel you have um, anyone you can regularly connect with in person, it's never too late to build new friendships. And you know, um, this, this whole thing about um, you know, saying what you need, and if, um, when our personality is we're self-sufficient and strong, and you've always been the giver and doer. And now you're depending on other people, maybe for the first time. Somebody said, oh, I never knew how much money my husband saved me when he was fixing things around the house. You know, now maybe to go to a neighbor and say, you know what, I don't know how to get this done. Can you please help me? And I'm sure they will, right? I'm sure they're going to be ready to do that and be supportive. But that's, that's a step to be brave, to be able to ask for help when you need it, when you are never used to. You're the one typically giving it, and now you have to receive it. That's a hard spot to be in. Seek help in your time of grief and loss. Accept that many people feel awkward when trying to comfort someone who is grieving. Grief can be confusing, sometimes frightening emotion uh, for many people, especially if they haven't experienced a similar loss themselves. They may feel unsure about how to comfort you and up saying or doing the wrong things. That's what end up, ends up happening. But don't use that as an excuse to, treat, uh, to retreat into your shell and avoid social contact. If a friend or loved one reaches out to you, it's because why? They do care. And even in the process, if they stumble, and I, I say this often, that in relationships, we can't help, but we're going to fall and stumble at times. We're going to run into edges and corners, and we're going to say things or do things that we don't really mean. And it's okay. isn't that great that we can start all over again? To just say, okay, you know what? Um, this is what it looks like. I wrote a whole bunch of stuff on this sheet of my life. Um, but tomorrow I can start all over again. A new beginning. And that's also true with our relationships. So they care. That's the key. And now we're going to watch a video clip. So let's uh, turn the lights off real quick. And I want you to pay attention because we're talking about the stages of grief. This lady, Sally Field, we all know her, she is going to manifest probably all the stages of grief in one conversation. And um, it's a little bit rough on the edges, but ignore that. And please, let's talk about it when it's done. I want to know why Shelby's life is over. I want to know how that baby will ever know how wonderful his mother was. Will he ever know what she went through for him? Oh, God, I want to know why. Why? Lord, I wish I could understand. No. 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 It's not supposed to happen this way. I'm supposed to go first. I've always been ready to go first. I don't think I can take this. I don't think I can take this. I, I just want to hit somebody so they feel as bad as I do. I just want to hit something. I want to hit it hard. Here. Hit this. Go ahead, my land. Swap her. Are you crazy? Hit her. Are you high, Clary? Clary, have you lost your mind? Well, tell T-shirt saying I slapped Weezer Boudreaux. Hit her. Clary, enough. Weezer. This is your chance to do something for your fellow man. Oh. Knock her lights out, Malia. Let go of me. Malia, you just missed a chance of a lifetime. Half a chick of Finn Parrish would give the eye teeth to take a whack of ways up. You are a pig from hell. Shelby was. Oh, right. Use that apple right there. Use that apple right there. And that's off. Now, did she 
manifest devil of the Savior? What were they? Denial. No, no, this can't be it. No. What else? A second bargaining. Bargaining. That whole statement that, you know, where Jesus said, I have to jump on one foot all the way to Texas and back, right? The, the question why is, is important, you know? And, you know, and we think, well, if we're strong Christians, we shouldn't be asking the question why. Well, let me just uh, liberate you right here and now. God can handle it. And you are going to be not the first or the last to ever ask the question why. And I shared this with some people in, um, in our church that I have been visiting a lady in the hospital. And I can't go into all the details. But one day I looked at the suffering of this woman and I said to myself, as I was walking back to my car, I said, Lord, why? And it would be so arrogant to try to explain it away or come up with some, you know, some Christian answer. Uh, based on the scriptures, as true as it is, we do ask the question why. And God is in charge. And when the time is right, he then explains that. It's my confidence in this church that one day in heaven, we're going to be called on. Did you know that? We're not going to have to worry in heaven anymore about why, why, why. Because all the answers will be clear and easy. But in the meanwhile, I think God gives us the liberty to ask. Draw comfort from your faith. You know, the things that you do in church, um, the singing the hymns. You know, Becky just mentioned about, about um, uh, enjoying singing the Lord's Prayer. You know, we don't always sing the Lord's Prayer when we're Bible teaching in the Lord's Prayer. We get the hymns. It's like, wow, what is the Lord's Prayer? It's like the first part of the ritual that you go through. And we have rituals in our church. And they will bring comfort to you. And, um, you know, you can talk to people on faith, exchange what other people, or exchange with other people who have experienced the same thing. Uh, um, join support groups. Um, you know, a lot of uh, places offer them. As a matter of fact, we have one right here in our church. Go to a folder, please. And on the left side, they add a church flyer here. a month, always on a Wednesday. It goes from 10 to 11.30, and um, everything that we discuss here is confidential. I always tell people, I don't even say anything on Sunday morning. You know what I'm saying? You know, and what you share there is personal. You can't go around and talk about what so-and-so said at the group focus room. It's all closed. It's But over to anyone who has it all, and then, um, you know, so that's just one thing for you to know. Our next one is Wednesday, February 27th. Okay. And um, uh, talk to a therapist, a grief counselor. I'm not going to go into all the details about that, but what I want to say to you is that I do think it's true that you go to a Christian therapist. You know, because obviously we're talking about um, your faith helping you. And once you meet your counselor or doctor, you're going to have to sit and deal with everything. They need not always beside you. You can't always give you advice. But guess what? The Holy Spirit in God can. And that's why the, the key for me as a pastor is I, if you say I, I'm looking for a counselor, a professional counselor, I will certainly send you to a Christian counselor <laughs> because that's you know, how it's being addressed. Social media, something to talk about. Um, social media can have a lot of positives, but it can also have and um, so let's uh, read through that. Promote your pages on Facebook and other social media sites have become popular ways to inform a wide audience of a loved one's passing and to reach out for support, as well as allowing you to impart practical information such as funeral plans. These pages allow friends and loved ones to post their own tributes or condolences. Reading such messages can often provide comfort for those grieving the loss. Of course, posting sensitive content on social media has its risks. Memorial pages are often open to anyone with a Facebook account. This may encourage people who hardly knew the deceased to post well-meaning but inappropriate comments or advice. Worse, memorial pages can also attract internet trolls. There have been many well-publicized cases of strangers posting crude or abusive messages on memorial pages. I mean, what do you do with that, right? Um, so I guess the reason why we are addressing this is because we live in an age where this matters, where it can be a positive thing, but it also can have tools that we can't even use to, you know, to damage. Yeah. 
Trump protection is an option in a closed group on Facebook Live in a public space, which means people have to be approved by a group member before they can access the memorial. It's also important to remember that while social media can be a useful tool for reaching out to others, it can't replace the face-to-face support we need to stay strong. All right? So that's what, that's what so for example, if we would, um, um, I mean, I've heard of virtual docs. Have you heard of that? We don't go to the doctor's office, but the doctor is on the screen and you can talk to them. Well, I guess that's not quite the same thing. You know? And some of you come um, from a relationship with your doctor where you had the same doctor for the last 40 years. You know? And there is a, there's a rapport, a connection that you have established. And so that's why we cannot replace that. And the recommended reading that we're going to start out with um, is on the display list here. Uh, I mean, center table. So these are books that are in our library that can be used in circulation when you're checking them out and when you're scanning them in your own reading. You can go to your own library, local library of Stephanie, or to just go ahead and find them and you can buy them there. This one is called What Grieving People Wish We Knew About What Really Helped and What Really Hurt. And so it's something that needs to be talked about. Maybe it can help, um, you know, put into perspective some of the experience with what we had. I know she may be back next week, Jeffrey, and I know that she um, talked to Stephanie Powell, who does the doctor that she did this with. All right. Now take care of yourself and your breathing. It's more important than ever to take care of yourself. The stress um, of nasal elasticity um, depletes your energy and emotional um, uh, reserves looking after your physical and emotional needs will help you get through this difficult time. Face your feelings. We've been trying to suppress your grief, but you can't avoid it forever. In order to heal, you have to acknowledge the pain, trying to avoid feelings of sadness and why only prolong the grieving process. Unresolved grief can also lead to complications such as depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and health problems. Um, I tried to maintain your hobbies and interests. Eventually, you can go back to that and pursue some of those again and go back to enjoying those. Don't let anyone tell you how you feel and don't tell yourself how you feel either. So that you really experience it even in that realm will come. And, you know, I was talking to um, a good friend of mine whose wife has Alzheimer's and she's fairly young. They're both still young, by the way. And um, we were talking about a lot of things that she's going through. And one of the things that I gave him as advice is to start keep journaling with how people are treating him and uh, what they're going through right now. And I just said to him, I said, you know, this is a really good way to get some people around you to know you have to keep having fun. This is how you should be spending your time. It can be your hobbies if you ask for it, but know that it's a beautiful place when you are ready to be with them. And that's what this is talking about. Don't let anyone tell you how to feel and don't tell yourself how to feel either. Your grief is your own, and no one else can tell you when it's time to move on or get over it. Let yourself feel whatever you feel without embarrassment or judgment. It's okay to be angry and yell at the heavens, to cry and not cry. It's also okay to laugh, to find moments of joy, and to let go when you are ready. All right. Well, I think we're going to come back to the same one. Well, and now we're going to watch one more video, and then we have a guest. Whilst we're getting better at accepting that men are allowed to show their emotional side, there are still perceptions that in times of loss, men need to be the strong ones. To set the record straight, big boys do cry. That's a sign of good grief. Here are some ideas about how men do their grieving. Men do feel grief, but tend to show it in different ways from women. When men are expected to be strong for their wife and family, by showing no emotion, this may come across as cold and unaffected, giving the illusion that he's coping okay. Men often see themselves as the protector of the family unit. So when a family member dies, they can feel like a failure and blame themselves. Men may not be accustomed to talking about feelings, so they choose to be silent or grieve privately. 
Some men try to cope by keeping busy. They could bury themselves in their work or become overly involved in activities to numb the pain or avoid what's happened. Sometimes men keep themselves busy to avoid their feelings and they will try alcohol or drugs to block them out. If you're a man who's grieving, then you need to find resourceful ways to help you deal with your grief. It is not a sign of weakness to talk about them or to get some help. Just finding someone you feel safe to talk to can be a great place to start. Can everyone hear me? Good. Um, Pastor asked me to share uh, my grief and my experience with that with you. And uh, this is when my brother Richard passed in uh, on November 19th, 2017. I got a call from his daughter saying that he had fallen off a roof in uh, uh, in uh, New York State while cleaning his gutters. So. You know, I, I, my first thought was, he's 67 years old. What's he doing on the roof cleaning his gutters? My second thought was, his son is 22 years old. Why wasn't he on the roof cleaning the gutters? So I went through that anger uh, at Richard and his son, Jack. But, you know, I got over that. And then my next feeling was concern and hope for a quick recovery. Because he had gone down, he landed on his head. It seemed like he didn't even put his hands out to break his fall, but I don't know that. He landed on a rock and had a brain bleed. So Holly called me and said, you know, this happened, but I'll call you back later with, uh, with his news of his progress. And all that time from the first call to the second call, I guess I'm doing the bargaining with God. I was saying, uh, please, you know, heal him. Uh, make him a whole person. Second call was massive brain bleed. If he survived, he would be a vegetable or in a vegetative state until the day he died, unable to care for himself at all. So then my bargaining with God went from uh, save him to pass him quickly. Because, you know, he's, <laughs> I've known him my whole life. So I, he would not want to live that way. So I said, Pass him quickly. So, he was a fisherman. I can look at that picture later, but uh, he fished. We fished when we were kids up in Canada and just loved up in the Kawarthas and in uh, uh, Bob Cajun, and you don't know where that is, but up in the lake country in Canada. Arlene knows where it is. <laughs> but anyway, we fished up there a lot and loved it. Great family times. So, uh, I thought to myself, how better to honor him? And Dick, let me retract that. Dick, he fished for walleye and muscalunge in the Niagara River and in Lake Erie. And he was very successful at it. And he enjoyed it. He was a writer. He authored five books and many essays. He had a blog, and I don't know if it's still up or not, but it's richardaminnickwriter.com. And it was about his family, his adventures, and his faith journey. Uh, he read the Bible extensively and faithfully, and he lived God's word. He led many mission trips into rural Georgia, helping people who needed the help and couldn't help themselves by rebuilding their houses or their churches or whatever it was. And uh, he was always uh, the inscrutable one. He would sit there, never got on the roof down there. I don't know why. But uh, in the, he was the, uh, the stoic. You know, they, they, My dad had this deadpan look on his face. I've got it. Dick, Dick, Dick had it, and David's got it. And it's one of those things where you, the kids know that they're in trouble when we sit there and do one of these. You know, my dad had that, and it was, uh, anyway, all these people, that, these kids that he worked with would uh, see that look and they know they did something wrong, and Dick would help them correct it. Anyway, um, led those many mission trips into uh, Georgia, and he wrote these 
books, five of them, and he centered one around a fictional character who was a fisherman in New York State named Joe Gaspé, fictional character. But Joe worked with the FBI and the Homeland Securities to uh, help prevent terrorism in the United States. And the first one was blowing up the peace bridge between Fort Erie and, and Buffalo. And they thwarted that. And then uh, the, I think the third one was uh, the terrorists got a hold of a dirty bomb and were going to detonate it under West Point Stadium on the line that runs, the railroad line that runs from Albany to New York. So I went to West Point with him and scrambled all up and down these hills and did the research for him on the book and, or with him on the book. Uh, they're not great books, they're not bestsellers, but they're fun to read. And if you want to read them, I got them. He was the middle brother of three, me being the oldest and brother Dave the youngest. This is where we get into the to honoring his memory. And uh, I started planning this shortly after he died and bought the t-shirts, one, two for me, two for Dave. Uh, had lists of food to buy on our trip into Canada, how to get there, where to stay, what to do, so forth and so on. So we went up to a little town called Biscotasing up in Ontario. It's north of Georgian Bay. It took us three and a half days to drive there. We stayed at Richie's End of Trail Lodge where you fish, eat, and sleep. There's no electricity, only propane stoves, propane refrigerator, propane uh, uh, lights. And you'll find out real quickly that when the sun goes down and you turn on the propane light to read your book, you go like this. So you, when, the light, when the sun goes down, you go to bed. When the sun comes up, you get up, you fish, you eat, you sleep. That, that's what there is to it. Uh, interesting now, the owner of the lodge, Brian Drysdale, winters down here at Rambler's Roost on River Road. He has a, his trailer parked right next to Tom and Darlene Phillips. So he's been coming to church here the last three or four or five weeks and loves it. Again, it's one of those things that you come here once, you're going to come here again. Uh, so anyway, we, fi we fished. Each day, we caught our limit. We, had, we ate fish up there four days. Each day, we had a good memory. We had a good long laugh. And we had an occasional cry. But it's a time for brothers to bond and remember and honor our fallen brother. We let go of our grief, came to terms with death of a beloved brother, and realized he's with our parents again. The jer that journey, our journey, gave us a sense of relief and communion with each other. When we left Bisco Tasting at quarter to six that morning with the frozen fish that we'd caught all week, we drove from Bisco Tasting, which is, it's three and a half hours to Sudbury, three hours to Toronto, another hour and a half to Buffalo, seven hours to Boston. We drove that and we got in at midnight. <laughs> Didn't stop. The only time we stopped was for gas and uh, get some coffee. David was a huge coffee drinker. Uh, anyway, we got to Biscuit Tasting with our fish. Uh, we got to Wenham, sorry, Wenham Mass with our fish and had a few beers and went to bed that night. The next day, and you can look this up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We came, <laughs> we brought back enough fish to feed seven adults, seven children, and we had plenty left over. And that's a true story. This is how I came to grips with the loss of my brother. Not for everyone, but that's the way I did it. A part of the process after, you know, we decided what we're going to do is the planning, the stages of planning, a hobby. You know, Cindy said, I plan more for our vacations than I do. Uh, I plan for a trip down to Osprey Produce. But uh, I do a lot of planning for that. So. Uh, now, to bring, there's a great song, an old-timey gospel song, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? And the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band did a great, great album with that on it. But to show you how the circle's now unbroken, or it is unbroken, Holly, his daughter, is pregnant and is going to have a baby boy March. in March. So that's how I arrived at, uh, or came to grips with the passing of my brother or our brother. Um, Pastor also asked me to talk to you about God in my life. Um, he's been in my life since I was born. He's protected me, 
He sheltered me. I was in Vietnam for a year and seven days. Every day I was there, we were rocketed. Uh, didn't know whether I was, was gonna land on or near me. You know, he had his hand over me for that year and seven days for sure. Uh, I started reading the Bible. I started about, I guess, two years ago. And I've read it through twice. I've got a reading plan, which you can get from the pastor. I've, Elida's got it now, or one of them. And it, it's a great resource for me. Reading and reflecting, God's been a great source in my life. <coughs> for all my life, he's blessed me with Cindy, with our children and our grandchildren. He's cared for me and taken care of me all of my life. Thank you. That was great, thank you, thank you. So basically going on this fishing trip to Canada was your way of bonding with your brothers. Um, now you have how many brothers? Okay, so it's just the two of you, all right. And uh, are you planning any follow-up things on, uh, along these lines? <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna have to talk to Cindy about that. <laughs> all right. It's my turn. Oh, it's your turn, okay. <laughs> well, you know, we just said, don't let anybody tell you how to grieve. <laughs> all right, let's see here what comes next. Ah, lunchtime, lunchtime. So let's go and, uh, oh, but before we do that, we have a couple of more announcements. Um, what is that? What are we doing? I need Patty's help, because my brain is like. Okay, so yeah, keep that in mind um, um, that uh, the evaluation forms, please, before you leave today, make sure you fill those out and um, leave those with us. And then, yes, we do have a love offering to help uh, defray some of the costs for the seminar. Um, but this is a free seminar. Let's have lunch. Let's pray for that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ladies again that uh, have prepared and uh, planned all this for us. Um, and we thank you that we can have enough food and we pray that you bless um, the remainder of our day. In Jesus' name, amen.
That, that was the Schubert Impromptu. Oh, yeah. At first they were thought we thought it was Ave Maria. No, no. 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 <laughs> the same composer, though, but yeah, okay. different people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
wanted to uh, just get your attention one more time here. Let's thank the ladies for the hospitality and the food. This was great. Thank you.
for a crust of bread or anything? Or? Oh, I'll, I'll get, grab my lunch. Yeah. This is dinner music. <laughs> yeah, I'll play this when everybody comes back and I sneak back there. They always say the play for me. Perfect. Okay, very good. I haven't seen it, but it sounds so good.
All right, so just one group here to the right. They are having so much fun. Uh, you have five minutes, and then we'll start. <laughs> they don't want to stop. <laughs> oh, I know, that is great. I know, I know. I was listening to it the entire time. It was fun. Oh, I know, I know. He's been adding to this ever since he started. So, I know, I know. And you know what? It's such a tough. <laughs> That's funny. I'll get you one. Just one? Yeah. You're welcome. Oh, dear. that that one is amazing. I don't know. Yeah, please. Yeah, you can take some. Ich bin so froh, dass Sie gekommen sind. Ich weiß, dass das nicht einfach ist, aber ich bin froh, dass Sie da sind. Ja, ist schwierig, ja. Und das war Ihre Schwester oder Schwägerin? Schwester. Schwester. Und wann ist die gestorben? Vor zwei Jahren. War sie krank? in der Nähe gewohnt, wo sie wohnt. Aha. Oh, gut, gut. Es tut mir leid, das wusste ich nicht. There you go. You're welcome. So you're still struggling with that cold, huh? Wow. You see, I think part of the problem is that we just keep giving it back to each other. It's like a cycle. It just won't stop. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, Patty is having another gift for us. So let's do that right now. She's holding up the basket like that, so that means we have another gift. Oh, okay. So this one is actually a devotional, uh, a devotional of comfort as you mourn, grieving the loss of a loved one, and uh, by Kathy Wunnenberg. Um, von Zondervan, great, reliable publisher, so that's what we're giving away. And now I'm going to go really down. Wow. Let's give her a hand. There you go. I'm so glad. Yes. <laughs> oh, gosh. We did not say that. <laughs> anyway, let us know uh, how, you, how you like it, and the same for the other book uh, that we gave away, uh, which is, that's right. Okay, so um, how did you like lunch? You know, the wonderful thing is when you go to a church, you always have good food. Yes, that's true. It was very, that was one thing I wanted to look at real quick. Ah, there it is. 
in your folder, if you, um, if you look up, you saw the um, brochure. We already talked about that, about our grief support group. Um, if you, um, and it's already on the 27th of January is going to be our next one at 10 o'clock here at the church. And if you wanted to um, get notifications about these meetings, just give us a call at the church and we'll put you on a list and you'll get an automated email, which we don't use for anything else. Um, and we'll, uh, you'll know when the next one is always. We'll automatically send you a reminder. And then, uh, we're already seeing that, we have lunch. Now let's take out the scripture again, um, because we want to review that. That's our guide throughout the day, and let's read it out loud together. Tell everyone who is discouraged, be strong, and don't be afraid. God is coming to your rescue. So this might be really a good um, uh, reminder to put on your refrigerator or somewhere where you can see it throughout the day as a reminder that that's God's promise to you. And we have another book uh, recommendation for you. We've talked a lot about for you how to communicate uh, with someone who is not being helpful. And in line with that, there's a great book. Um, there's over two million that have been sold of this. Um, this is called Boundaries. It's a New York Times bestseller by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. And it says when to say yes and how to say no and to take control of your life. When we go through changes like that, that's really key. And they also have now an updated and expanded edition with boundaries for the digital age. And we already talked about that as well. Um, so this is another one for you to look at and um, consider maybe buying. All right, and now we're going to have Elida Carpenter come, and she's going to share her story with us. Let's give her a hand. Okay. let me prepare you for the day that stretches out before you. I know exactly what this day will contain, for you have only vague ideas about it. And then I'm just going to read the scripture in the bottom. It says, remain, this is from John 15, 4 to 7. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. <coughs> Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. I've asked, and I hope it's given to me. When my husband first passed, I, I did many things that comforted me. I designed a couple of shirts that I could wear any time that, that seemed to make me always feel that he was a bit closer to my heart, and this was one of them. I copied the words from a card that one of our very dear friends sent me that says, when someone you love becomes a memory, that memory becomes a treasure. One of our granddaughters asked for some of Papa's favorite shirts, and so I sent her some. I didn't know what she planned to do with them, but that didn't matter to me. But she had some one of her friends make little teddy bears, which she gave one to each one of our daughters and one to every grandchild. And these are made from all his favorite old shirts. She also had a lapidary made for me for my school, and that's all throughout her shirt. She actually had two of them, one for my, top, my chair here and one for my hand in dance. So those are precious gifts. I've left my husband's recliner chair just as it was. His prayer shawl given to him by the ladies of the church 
was on the back of the chair. He was that awesome. He was very, just what he needed for those little extra bit of warmth. He considered it a very comfortable throw. I also left his heavy chair, heavy, I'm sorry, his heavy shirt on the side of his chair. He draped it over his chair, so if he ever got cool, which he often did, he didn't have to get up and go looking for it. It was there. That's a different story. And then our daughter and son-in-law comes over. Our son-in-law always says, they talk his chair. He always <laughs> wears that shirt. I also believe in the saying that when cardinals are near, it's a sign that someone from heaven is visiting you. When we go to our daughter, we have a daughter that lives in Venice, and she has lots of dinners. And whenever we go over there for dinner, they have a lanai that has an absolutely beautiful backyard. Uh, and we always eat in the lanai, if the weather is permitting, and so far it has been. And they have a beautiful big tree, lots of beautiful flowers. And on the tree, there are a couple of bird feeders. And I have pictures every time, with the exception of maybe three, a cardinal lands in that and stays there most of the time that we're eating. I also have lots of cardinals throughout the house. In fact, I have eight little ornaments in my living room <laughs> when I'm not very busy. My grandson was a graphic designer. He, this was a postcard that he designed, but he also designed a big eight and a half by ten photo that I have hanging in the back of that book in my dining room. <coughs> Each year on my husband's birthday, we celebrate by going out to eat at his favorite restaurant, which is in Sarasota, Florida. It's the Dutch Heritage. I don't know if any of you have been there. If you haven't, if you haven't you should. When we celebrate his birthday, we all go out to eat, and every one of them have one of his favorite shirts. <laughs> we all put on the favorite shirt over our clothes like this. While we're having our dinner. Now we've done this every time. It just doesn't look hot, or, but nobody's really said anything. But this year, we went the second time because uh, we had children from Oregon that were here. We hadn't been here for the first time. So we went the second time. And the hostess said, The hostess took us, took us to our seats, and she stopped and smiled, and she said, Do you mind if I ask, is there something about these shirts? And so my, we just smiled, and our daughter explained. And after that, the, the waiter came to take our order, which doesn't take long because we all take the buffet. And he said, he took our order, but he sort of turned and came back, and he said, Sorry, but do these shirts mean anything? Of course, we have little ones 10 years old, and then to my age, and so it does probably look really strange. And so my daughter again explained, and she said, oh, how neat. And surely, about two minutes later, another waitress came by, and she smiled, and she said, do you mind? Is there meaning to these shirts? I don't know if they told each other. I don't know. But anyway, so then we went to the buffet, and... <coughs> I hear everybody say, oh, you have to have the chicken. Remember how Papa liked that? And, oh, and remember how he put that peanut butter spread on anything he had? And, oh, yes, grab a piece of dessert. Papa said you can have that any time. It doesn't matter. So then we all we get really filled up. And first of all, one of our grandchildren would say the blessings every time one of them does that. So we get really filled up, and I hear somebody say, we'll just have to have a little bit more for Papa. And dessert? You have to have a little more, no matter how filled up you are, because Papa never went away without dessert. And we all ate way too much, but that's just what we always did when we went there. Another tradition that we have now, I have a picture of us at the table there if anybody wants to see it. Another tradition that we do also is my daughter went to places like Goodwill, and she bought several individual dinner plates. Uh, and then she brought them all home and wanted us each to pick one. So Cardi picked his. I brought it just because I still have it here. And it's really deep. And he said, 
The reason I picked this one is because it has a big, big, deep center and it holds lots of baby. <laughs> so we all chuckled. And now I use his plate instead of mine, and it does hold lots of baby. <laughs> Now, in the past year, I've been trying to move on in a different way in my life. God has always been in my life, but I never realized just how much I was missing the point, so to speak. I started to recognize a little more each day that I needed God desperately. And with much encouragement from Pastor Attila and my church family, I felt like I was getting the direction that I really needed. And a certain message that Pastor Attila preached one Sunday last year, I will never forget the feeling that went through my body. It was like, stood up and listened to Elida, this is for you. The two scriptures that he read were just hitting me. So I went home, and I copied the scripture lessons that he had read that day down. And I put them on a little pocket prayer shawl, which I carry with me everywhere I go. And may God help me. <clears throat> so believe me, all things are possible. I'm also trying to focus on more faith, less fear, less anxiety. I'm constantly trying to take the big step, and that's called the leap of faith. First, I started going to the evening Bible study, and I'm enjoying that. And now I have so much to learn. Then I became even braver, and after a little, after a few invitations, I decided to try the Tuesday morning Bible study. I belong to the women's ECC group, the prayer shawl knitting group, and I've gone, <clears throat> gone on a few of the church-sponsored trips, the Holy Land Experience in Orlando, the family retreat at Bay Spring in Ellington, a couple of the Christmas passion plays, and they have all been a wonderful experience. And now they are doing a trip to Israel, and I'm just thinking about that. <laughs> Pastor Attila and my church family have given me so much guidance and have inspired me in so many ways, and my response can only be, praise God. When my husband was getting very ill, our pastor from North came to visit us. He was in Orlando at a conference, and he called to see if we were up for a visit, and we said, of course we are. So he came over, and between meetings, and had lunch with us, and he stayed with us for about two hours. And I just remember hearing my husband say, first of all, you have to know my husband loved God's creation. He loved the hills, he loved the mountains, he loved the sea. And I just remember him saying to Pastor Jason that day, you know, Jason, the grass is just a little bit greener this year. And those words ring in my ears today. And I say, dear friend, you know, the grass is just a little green for you. Thank you. Thank you, Elida. Let's give her a hand one more time. Okay, so in your folder again, if you take out your folder, take the um, pink slip on the left-hand side. Here you can sign up for a daily scripture email that we send out. Um, all you have to do is send us an email and let us know that you want to be added to our list that goes out Monday through Friday. And it has on Mondays also a thought for the week. We've been doing this now for quite a few years, and we don't use this for anything else. You just get a scripture, um, a New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament scripture, and that's it. Um, you know, we don't use it to advertise or anything. Just uh, simply be in the Word, and it's simple enough. Um, I was uh, at Becky Rooney's house a few weeks back. And Sandra McKeon was there too, and she had just received it on her iPhone, and she showed it to me, and I was impressed. It looked great. She had a great screen. <laughs> it looked it looked very nice, and um, so you can you can get it um, also on your phone, however you access your emails, so you can sign up for that. All right. Then another recommendation, book recommendation, um, for caregivers and those that uh, take care of loved ones. 
Um, there is a wonderful book out. It's, it's a new one or newer book. It's co-authored by Deborah Barr, Edward G. Shaw, and uh, Gary Chapman. Gary Chapman wrote many years ago a wonderful book called The Five Love Languages. And it's based on that same principle and it's called Keeping a Love Alive as Memories Fade, The Five Love Languages and the Alzheimer's Journey. You know, talking about loss and, and what you are grieving and when you are in that situation, um, that's a wonderful new addition um, to our library. Let's see, what else do we have? So when grief continues, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about um, the topic of grief. As time passes following a significant loss, such as the death of a loved one, it's normal uh, for feeling of sadness, numbness, and anger to gradually ease. So that is the part um, that we are talking about, that it does get better. These and other difficult emotions become less intense as you begin to accept the loss and start to move forward with your life. However, if you aren't feeling better over time or your grief is getting worse, it may be a sign that your grief has developed into a more serious problem such as, and you've probably heard that expression before, complicated grief or even major depression. And um, the sadness of losing someone you love never goes away completely, but it shouldn't remain center stage. And uh, if the pain of the loss is so constant and severe that it keeps you from resuming your life, you may be suffering from a condition known as complicated grief. Complicated grief is like being stuck in an intense state of mourning. You may have trouble accepting the death long after it has occurred or be so preoccupied with the person who died that it disrupts your daily routine and undermines your other relationships. So that's what we would call then complicated grief. That is not that you know you, you honor them, you remember them and all that. That's not what this is talking about. This is just that it centers around that. Um, the other thing is symptoms of complicated grief would include the following. Intense longing and yearning for your deceased loved one. Well, I mean in, in grief and mourning that's part of it, but this, this also with time should be um, should be less center stage, I guess. Intrusive thoughts or images of your loved one, denial of the death or sense of disbelief, imagining that your loved one is alive, searching for your deceased loved one in familiar places, avoiding things that remind you of your loved one, extreme anger or bitterness over your loss, and feeling that life is empty or meaningless. And uh, so that, you know, um, you know, that whole part of uh, where it's talking about uh, avoiding things that remind uh, you of your loved one. And I don't know you, about you, but when I originally, uh, when my dad died, I have done that. I have avoided looking at video, uh, video recordings that we had of, of trips to Washington, D.C. or Niagara Falls or stuff like that because I felt it was too painful to deal uh, with, with the loss. But over the years, I have learned and I'm doing better with that. But I don't necessarily choose it. I still, it's still hard to do that. Um, but that not everybody deals with it the same way. Um, if your loved one's death was sudden, violent, or otherwise extremely stressful or disturbing, complicated grief can manifest as psychological trauma or PTSD. I was talking to someone during break and they said that for many of the veterans, uh, and I don't know even know who said that now to me, that for many of the veterans, that's right, uh, Carolyn. Um, can you repeat that? Because you can probably say it better than I can. But I thought it was important. Uh, we, were, we were talking about uh, my mom and then my dad. My dad's still alive and he's 95 years old. Uh, they lived in assisted living. Uh, they, they had the, the care there, but uh, Probably in the last year, they've had hospice come in and out, and they've they've been very wonderful. They're definitely very attentive, and they keep in touch with us, send us text messages, about update us. But anyway, uh, my dad, uh, he was in World War II, uh, over in the Army, primarily in Germany, and uh, when he came back, he did like a lot of the World War II. You know, they all went to work, they got married, they had families, and you know, they retired and had 
hopefully good retirements. Him and my mom, they traveled a lot. They had a great, great time when, when he had retired. Uh, but in the last few years, uh, the, the doctor and, and the care there, they noticed he, he had gotten to the point to where he slept mostly, almost 24 hours a day in bed and kind of like the fetal position. And he just, he didn't want to watch his old TV shows. He, he didn't want to eat. He, we really didn't know how long he was going to last. And uh, they, a after getting him some help and, and discussions and talking with him and hearing about his background, they told us that a lot, especially the, a lot of the World War II veterans, they, they had late onset PTSD as usually as they got older, and like in his case, it probably he probably started getting into the PST, PTSD probably in his around 92 years old for the last three years or so. Hmm. Uh, so they've been able to talk with him through that, and uh, and and he's he's especially since my mom passed away. Uh, the first two weeks after he after she passed away, uh, he kept asking my older sister that goes by there every day. You know, it's like she would he would say, "Where is your mom? Is she out shopping again? Is she gonna come home?" <laughs> so my sister kept explaining. Hospice would talk to him, and then uh, now he's. Uh, I, I don't know, I contribute a lot of it to, I think, the hospice people because they've been so wonderful with him. But getting him through the, the PTSD that he had gone through, he gets out of bed every day. He still needs help, you know, getting dressed, for, you know, bathing. And, uh, but he probably hadn't walked down to the dining room in probably at least three or four years. Mm. And they would have to push him in a wheelchair, and a lot of times he wouldn't even go down there. And now every day he gets up, he's actually walking himself down there. He, there's a lot of women there. It's mostly women. And they all love sitting with him and chatting with him. And he, it's amazing. He's like a whole different person. But he's, he's I don't know, it, it was kind of interesting when we found out that, mm. you know, the, the psychological effect that came so much later, you know, in life. Very good words. Wow. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. And you did forget to tell that he tells some of the ladies if he doesn't want them to sit with him, right? <laughs> That's the part where you have to speak up if somebody's not being helpful. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I thought that was funny. <laughs> nope, you can't sit here. All right. So, um, uh, feeling helpless and struggling with upsetting emotions, memories, and anxiety that won't go away. You may have been traumatized, but with the right guidance, you can make healing changes and move on with your life. So, the difference between grief and depression, this is important, distinguishing between grief and clinical depression isn't always easy as they share many symptoms, um, but there are um, ways to tell the difference. Remember, grief can be a roller coaster. It involves a wide variety of emotions and a mix of good and bad days. Even when you are in the middle of a grieving process, you will have the moments of pleasure and ha or happiness. With depression, on the other hand, the feelings of emptiness. Oops, where are we now? Let's see. Well, the point is that it's constant. It won't go away, you know, is it? Okay, so that the emptiness and despair are constant. They, that's the difference between. In the, in the regular um, cycle of, of grieving, you will have the ups and downs. You will have days of deep sadness, but you will have times of pleasure, pleasure and happiness. But with the depression, it's a feeling of emptiness and despair all the time. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't go away. So other symptoms that suggest depression, not just grief, include intense, pervasive sense of guilt that never goes away, uh, thoughts of suicide or preoccupation with dying, feelings of hopelessness or worthlessness, 
slow speech and body movements, inability to function at home, work, uh, and or school, seeing or hearing things that aren't there. Any questions, comments, anything you want to say? No. Um, so to seek professional help, if you are experiencing symptoms of complicated grief or clinical depression, talk to a mental health professional right away. Left untreated, complicated grief and depression can lead to significant emotional damage, life-threatening health problems, and even suicide, but treatment can help you to get better. Um, um, so contact a grief counselor or professional therapist, and again, I want to underline that we're talking Christian counseling. Feel uh, like life isn't worth living. You should be contacting a counselor. Wish you had died with your loved one. Blame yourself for the loss or for fall, uh, failing to prevent it. Feel numb and disconnected from others for more than a few weeks. Are having difficulty trusting others since your loss and are unable to perform your normal daily activities. Go ahead. counselors, where would you get a list that would you say that you know these are Christian-based counselors? I would say go to your church and ask, ask the pastor or ask okay. the office there. Uh, okay. They should have uh, contact and access to that in each community who the Christian counselors okay, are. Okay, so do we have that in our church? Yes, we do. Okay, good. That's, that's the answer. Yes, we can, we can help you out there. But the church is always a good, a good uh, starting point if you are looking for... Um, for counseling, additional counseling, for Christian counseling, and you can definitely be helped and uh, be guided into the right direction there. Prayer shawl ministry, Elida, can you help us with that? Um, we have a prayer shawl ministry here at our church, and um, would you come forward and share a little bit about that? And uh, Anne is also part of that. Anybody else who comes to that here? Anne, raise your hand so we know who you are. There, there she is. <laughs> oh, she does, <laughs> okay. <laughs> she did talk you into it. <laughs> I'm only speaking because Anne's voice isn't good. <laughs> um, Anne and I are right now co-chairing this little prayer shawl thing. Um, it's wonderful. I'm not a great knitter. I taught myself to knit. And I just come because there's companionship, there's love, and there's a lot of meaning to what these people who get these prayer shawls, how they feel. We took some to the gardens. The people there were overjoyed. They couldn't believe that we would be giving them prayer shawls. They looked at them, thought they were beautiful, but didn't realize they were going to become theirs. So we have some prayer shawls here that we've made, and we'd like each one of you to take one. And you're certainly welcome to join. Come anytime. Join us. We meet second and fourth, second and fourth Tuesday of each month. We just have sit down, pray over our knitting shawls, and visit. Just have a good time, and we're doing some good for someone. Thank How you. Many of you oh, over 60. over 60. And they're made to provide comfort and love and warmth. So, so um, let's take a five minute little breather and go ahead and take yourself a prayer shawl. Bitte. Ein, Sie können auch eins haben. Kein Problem. Jeder, jeder kann eins, kann eins nehmen.
thing we'll just open the doors and people in closing they can get a cup of coffee and then slowly mingle out you know i'm going to do it like that is that okay no fair enough thank you magának egyet? Kati, vett egyet? Vett egyet. Jó van. Jó, Jó nyugodtan. And by the way, there is enough of them here. If maybe you say, I don't want one, but you might know of someone who would like, you would like to take one to, you're welcome to do that as well. So I see that um, uh, we have all um, received one, and again, on your way out, you're more than welcome to take if you um, know of someone that you would like to share it with. Let's go to our folders and go through all our uh, inserts here um, that we've prepared for you. I would like you to take this one, the orange one, and this one is entitled New Year's Resolutions for Grievers. Well, we're certainly still in the new year. And I'm just going to go through the different points that um, these resolutions are suggesting. And of course, you can add um, or subtract. Number one, go easy on yourself. Uh, spend time with people you like. Engage in one hobby or activity that makes you feel good. Be honest about how you feel. Speak your loved one's name. Live in a way your loved one would have wanted support someone else. You know, that's really important. Sometimes the best thing that we can do when we are sad or going through a hardship is do something for someone else and it will really affect you and uh, on a, in a positive way. Plan opportunities for remembrance. Elida brought up many of those examples of what they are doing like, um, can, I, can I take this one? Yeah, like this one, um, this teddy that um, everyone in the family you said got? Uh, two daughters and all the grandchildren, seven of them, and they're made out of the shirt of Cardi. Okay, so how many great-grandchildren? Ten. Okay, all right. So uh, seek professional help. And the last one, um, no, that was it. So... That was one. Let's go to the green one, the green insert. The 10 best and 10 worst things to say to someone in grief. Well, I think we should read through that. Let's start out with the first one, the, best, the 10 best things to say to someone in grief. I am sorry for your loss. It does not sound like a phrase. I think if you look in the person's eyes and say, say that, and obviously mean it, the people can sense that and appreciate it. 
I wish I had the right words, just know I care. I don't know how you feel, but I'm here to help in any way I can. You and your loved one will be in my thoughts and prayers. My favorite memory of your loved one is, so somebody's saying like Becky brought up that people are still talking about the fact how Ralph used to sing the Lord's Prayer. That's a memory they have, and that's a memory that you like to hear um, people share with you. Uh, I'm always just a phone call away. Give a hug instead of saying something, you know, so it does, it's not warranted that we actually have to say anything. You can just, you know, presence can make a difference. We all need help at times like this. I'm here for you. I'm usually up early or late if you need anything. Saying nothing and just be with the person. Now, on the next page, or if you flip it around, the worst things to say to someone in grief, we already mentioned some of those, but here's one. At least she lived a long life. Many people die young. Well, that's true, but it's not helpful. You know, it's not, it doesn't add uh, to it. It just, well, if anything, it just subtracts. Um, he is in a better place. She brought this on herself. There's a reason for everything. And you know what? I have to tell you, if it's on the list, I'm sure it's been said. You know, I mean, they don't, don't just come up with this, but I'm sure somebody somewhere has made a statement like that. Aren't you over him yet? He has been dead for a while now. <laughs> you can have another child still. She was such a good person. God wanted her to be with him. I know how you feel. She, that's right, we don't. Uh, she did what she came here to do, and it was her time to go. And then the last one, <laughs> again, if God says it, it's okay, but if you and I say it, it doesn't go over too well. Be strong. Because the person might rightfully ask, how am I going to be strong? Let's go to the yellow one. Now, this one, um, I just thought we actually had a book in our library, and we're uh, trying to track it down, but we had a book in our library, and... That one uh, was called The Loss of a Child. And, um, but since we are not able to locate it right now, I thought I'd put something in there that if you, are, uh, if you have lost a child, uh, grieving a child, this is called A Mother's Chorus, Grieving a Child on Mother's Day. I read through it, and it's uh, really amazing. Um, it's worthwhile for you to um, look at that. And then... Um, Dealing with the grieving process and learning to heal. Uh, what is grief? It makes a whole list of things. Divorce or relationship breakup, loss of health, losing a job, loss of financial stability, a miscarriage, retirement, death of a pet, loss of a cherished dream, a loved one's serious illness, loss of a friendship, loss of safety after a trauma, and selling the family home. And the last insert that we have for you is on the purple page. It's two-sided, and these are scripture references um, connected to grief. Two whole pages that you can look up, and they're categorized when you're in trouble, when you need comfort, when you are afraid, when you are worried. And somebody was asked to define, no, it was C.S. Lewis, who is writing in one of his books, he said, I never knew and nobody ever told me that grief feels so much like fear. Fear of what? The unknown. What else? Being alone. How about the future? What will the future hold, right? So there's a lot of fear that's connected to grief. And um, so it's good for us to have scriptural references that help us um, to let uh, go of our fear. Let's read the scripture again. Tell everyone who is discouraged, be strong and don't be afraid. God is coming to your rescue. Let's see here. So let's turn off the lights and we're gonna watch a video. Grief is confusing. And we often wonder, am I doing grief right? This feels like it's taking too long. Uh, it, it's kind of like that experience that you have whenever you're driving somewhere new for the first time and somebody tells you it's only three miles, it's really easy to find and you're driving and you're going, did I miss my turn? Did I miss my turn? I've not done this before. 
And the whole time, you just, you have this sense, am I doing it right? And because grief is such a new experience, and, and every time we experience grief, it's new, there's this sense, am I doing it right? And as soon as that question comes into our mind, am I doing it right? The necessary implication is maybe I'm doing it wrong. And wrong is a guilt word. And then I begin to beat myself up because I can't even grieve right. And it becomes another one of those inroads where guilt uh, begins to magnify the experience of grief. Another thing that happens in terms of creating the impact of grief uh, is how we associate the loss with things that were going on at the same time. Uh, sometimes we do that through regret. Uh, and we say, ah, if only grandma had lived two weeks longer, then she would have made it to the wedding. And there's the kind of this permanent regret memory attachment to my wedding and the loss of grandma. Other times it is association. And we begin to think, ah, oh, we were we went to the beach and that was the last thing that we did together before I lost them. I don't know that I'll ever go to the beach the same way again. Uh, or sometimes it's through guilt. Uh, and we begin to think right around the time that, that I lost this person, I had also uh, cheated or fudged a little on my taxes. And I wonder if this is God getting back at me. There's often this fear of, I'm going to lose these memories. I carry the weight of being their historian. My encouragement uh, to folks at a time like that um, is just to begin to build a timeline of memories. Uh, just in a bulleted form, going down a page, write the things that you remember in the midst of that relationship. Uh, and, and the goal there, partly that's good just to remember and to put it on paper. And so just as I put it down on the piece of paper, it helps me lose that fear of if I don't remember these things, nobody's going to remember my loved one. All right. I have another resource I wanted to share with you. This one is um, a DVD, actually, that's also in our library. This is si a 65-minute um study and this one is called where is god in the midst of tragedy and suffering we already uh, touched on that a little bit that there are a lot of difficult questions um uh you know and hardships that you personally on a personal level have experienced and i think it's good to ask that question and how does our faith fit into these things that we cannot explain so easily all right so that's another thing that you can look at and then, what's next? So you can always be in touch with us. And we're on Facebook. And you can visit us on our website. And don't forget to fill out the survey. How many of you have filled it out already? That's almost 100%. I'm still waiting for the rest. All right, and um, I wanted to thank you for your attention. We are done with the seminar. What I would like to offer this time that we have not done in the past is we're going to have the doors open up, and instead of us just filing out right away, you can still have a cup of coffee, talk to each other, spend some more time together. And I am offering for anybody who is here who needs prayer that I'll gladly pray with you. So that is going to... Uh, be the closing of our seminar that you can come forward and pray for anything that's going on in your life but before we do that I have uh, one final opportunity to given you like uh, is there anything that's on your heart that you would like to talk about ask or comment on yes my friend <coughs> Karen up north in Virginia I said it the other day she lost her father in April, her brother in August, and her mother after Christmas. And she's going through a terrible time. And I like, she really would profit from if she would come to a seminar like this. And uh, her brother had six kids, and those six kids could not bury their father. She has to come up with three funerals. It's, I mean, it's heartbreaking. Some of her other relatives helping her out and she needs prayers real bad. And <clears throat> like we say in German, geteiltes Leid ist halbes Leid. So maybe you can translate that. That's what my mother taught me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's
a good saying. It means when you share in someone's suffering or pain, it's only half that bad. So because you're taking the other half, right? That's kind of how I would translate that. A shared pain is half the pain. Thank you. Well, let's pray for Karen then right now. She's in Virginia, you said? Well, Heavenly Father, we uplift to you, uh, Karen. You see her um, ma uh, many losses that uh, Erica was talking about and um, a sense of overwhelmed is probably not doing it justice. It's more than that. It's um, life changing in so many ways. And we just pray that you help uh, Karen in her situation and comfort her and strengthen her and send people in her path who would have just the right words to say and be a good friend in Jesus' name. And I do want to pray for Koti. Um, she has had uh, just a very difficult time since she has come back from Hungary. And um, I, it's like I can't go into all the details, but it's, uh, it's difficult, and um, I want to pray for her too. Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, uh, Koti that you would uh, please provide for her in her time of loss and need. You know exactly what it is, and we know that you can help her and give her everything that's needed here. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Any other comments or questions? Yes. I was too bashful early to see this, but I laughed at my father's funeral, which was sort of a shock to me. But he had a lot of stories to tell. And the pastor came to see him. He's in the hospital four days before he passed away. He said to the pastor, son, I've got a thousand stories to tell you. And he said, the pastor said, we have a lot of stories to tell, but we don't know how much time we have to tell them. What was your dad's name? Bob Miller. Okay, very good. Yes. <laughs> yes, we had an unexpected loss in our church. Um, very shocking to all of us, so we pray for the Jewel family. Lord God, uh, you know uh, what they are right now experiencing, where they're at, and uh, they're in that initial shock, and uh, we pray that uh, your love would help them through it. And uh, there too, we just pray for the right people to come alongside them and be just a good friend to them in their time of need. In Jesus' name, be our comforter. Amen. Anybody else? For Mar Martha? Yeah, Lord, uh, you know about Martha's health situation and uh, family and everything that's going on in her life and we uplift her to you and entrust her care and her future into your hands. It's in the best place there, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if there's nothing else, then these doors will open up. Um, you know, you can say, um, we'll spend some more time there with another cup of coffee, but anybody who needs personal prayer, I'll be right here praying with you. Have I forgotten something? Oh, okay, very good. <laughs> Well, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so if, uh, you know, again, thank you to everyone who helped make this happen today. Thank you.
you for your attention, I guess.